Hello everybody, this is Mr. Seymour, and in this lesson, we're going to talk about Chapter 9, Interest Groups. And I know we uh, skipped over a chapter here on Chapter 8, we'll get to that next week, but I wanted to do Interest Groups along with um, political parties, because I think the two deserve to be side by side. The debate over federal district student loan, federal direct student loans pitted well-funded banks and other financial institutions against millions of college students and their parents. Did the bank's ability to lobby members of Congress and bureaucrats translate into a policy victory? Well, a lot of people would argue yes. Interest groups are organizations of people who share common political beliefs and aim to influence policy by electioneering, which means influencing the outcome of elections, and by lobbying, which means directly appealing to or talking to uh, decision makers who are already in office. Lobbying are, is efforts to influence public policy through contact with public officials on behalf of an interest group. Now, there are three resources that are necessary for an interest group to succeed. First is people, second is money, and the third is expertise. Types of interest groups. The first type is business. These are for-profit enterprises who aim to influence policy in ways that will increase profits or satisfy other goals. And examples would include Google, Facebook, Citibank, Exxon, and Boeing and Sally May. Sally May has to do with uh, student more uh, trading student mortgage or student loans. Um, it trades student loans the way that f uh, Freddie May, Freddie Mac, and uh, Fannie Mae trade um, uh, house mortgages. Uh, activities, lobbying operations that petition government for contracts or favorable regulations of their firm or industry. The second group type of interest group is a trade or peak uh, association. Groups of businesses often in the same industry that band together to lobby for policies that benefit them all. Examples would include the National Sports Shooting Foundation, which is the trade association for all gun manufacturers. Activities include lobbying operations that petition government for contracts or favorable regulations of their industry. The next type of group is a professional organization. These are for-profit enterprises who aim to influence policy in ways that will increase profits or satisfy other goals. Examples, the National Association of Realtors, the American Bar Association, and the American Medical Association. Their activities include lobbying operations that petition government for contracts or favorable regulations of their association, industry, and or profession. Labor organizations. These are mostly unions representing workers in a particular industry or field. Examples would be the largest um, labor organization, which is the AFL-CIO. American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations. It's huge. Activities. These organizations lobby for regulations that make it easy for workers to form labor unions as well as for a range of other policies or actions such as negotiations and strikes. Citizen groups. These range from organizations with mass membership like the Sierra Club and the National Rifle Association to those with no members at all, but who claim to speak for large segments of the population, for example, the Family Research Council. Activities, promoting a range of policies and or legislation that benefit the group as a whole. Institutional interest groups are formed by nonprofits such as universities, think tanks, or museums. Examples include the Committee on Industrial Cooperation, which is a group of universities, including the Big Ten and the Midwest, that prepare research, helping individual universities make the case for federal, financial, and legislative support. Different organizational structures have trade-offs. Centralized organizations, which are national organizations with a centralized leadership, can be more efficient, but don't tend to learn what their members want. Confederations, which are coalitions of independent local organizations, 
have a good understanding of what their members want, but are often beset by conflict as one local chapter's goals conflict with the goals of another. Interest group staff typically have expertise in the policy area or else have experience in Congress, connections, and understanding of how government works. This need for connections has led to the revolving door where people move back and forth between government and lobbying. <clears throat> in mass associations, members are individuals. In peak associations, members are businesses. Studies show that people that join interest groups, either out of a sense of internal obligation or duty, external coercion, or selective in incentives. Solidary benefits are uh, the satisfaction that's derived from the experience of working with like-minded people. Purpose of benefits are so the satisfaction derived from the experience of working towards a desired policy or goal. Coercion is a method of eliminating free riding. Remember free riding? Where uh, one or more people benefit from the group, the work of the group as a whole. They, they uh, attempt to eliminate free riding by potential group membership by requiring participation as in many labor unions. And selective incentives are benefits that are available only to those who participate, such as, as member services offered by interest groups. The best example of selective incentives I can think of is the American Automobile Association. If you're a member of the American Automobile Association, your selective benefit is that you, you can have a, a tow truck come out and help you in case you break down on the side of the road. But the American Automobile Association does a lot of lobbying and that lobbying benefits everybody uh, that drives or has a car. The AAA, formerly the American Automobile Association of America, is a well-known provider of emergency road services. Yet few people are aware of its role as an interest group that lobbies for a wide range of policy changes and builds awareness of key transportation issues. This data, shows that, this data shows that in recent years, interest groups have spent several billion dollars lobbying the federal government. Does this amount seem surprisingly large or surprisingly small, given what lobbyists do and given the total of uh, federal outlays of money? So the total spending on lobbying in billions peaked in 2015 at about 3.25 and has remained fairly steady since 2011 at about 3.2 3, uh, billion. Billion with a B. This data shows that in recent years, interest groups have spent several billion dollars lobbying the federal government. Does this sum seem surprisingly large or surprisingly small given what lobbyists do and given the total amount of federal outlays of money. Remember, the total federal budget is in the trillions. Okay, so the total federal outlay in 2015 was $3.76 trillion. And uh, so um, $3.15 billion is a drop in the bucket in comparison. But uh, when you're dealing with billions of dollars, it's still a lot of money. Lobbying expenditures vary widely. Some influential groups, such as the United States Chamber of Commerce, spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year. But many other influential groups, such as NARAL and the Family Research Council, spend relatively little. How can groups have influence over government policy despite spending almost nothing on lobbying? Easy. They have their members do it. It's a matter of membership participation. Now, there are two kinds of strategies, inside and outside strategies. Inside strategies are tactics that are used by interest groups within Washington, D.C. to achieve their policy goals. Outside strategies are strateg tactics used by interest groups outside Washington, D.C. to achieve their policy goals. So an inside strategy would be going directly to a, a, uh, um, a congressman or a senator 
and lobbying that congressman or senator in Washington and trying to um, get legislation passed or get certain things done. Outside strategies would be things like getting all your members together across the country and uh, forming um, uh, some kind of uh, protest or uh, some kind of uh, a group activity. There are a host of inside strategies. Nearly all interest groups dedicate time to the first three, which are direct lobbying, drafting legislation and regulations, and offering expertise through research and in hearings and in sworn testimony. Litigation is less common as it's costly and time consuming. Nonetheless, it can be an effective way of shaping policy. So direct lobbying would be speaking with government officials to change policy, providing information, and typically focusing on those that, that are your friends, your allies. Also, 75% of interest groups draft proposals for members of Congress. Most legislation that's introduced to these days is done so uh, prepared by lobbyists. And then research and testimony and litigation are also methods of direct lobbying. The American Civil Liberties Union is an interest group that often uses litigation strategies in its efforts to change government policy. Here are members of the ACLU chapter in Washington state announcing their filing of an abortion rights issue lawsuit against several local hospitals. Mass protests such as the 2014 People's Climate March in New York City are intended to attract media attention and demonstrate the depth of policy support for a group's goals. So this is called grassroots lobbying. Now, when a group tries to uh, convince people that it's grassroots lobbying by bringing people together and influencing the, a, a large group of people, that is called astroturf lobbying because you're setting up artificial grassroots. An interest group's ability to engage in electioneering depends on how it is organized. Specifically, what section of the IRS code applies to the organization? This table gives details on four common organizations, the 501C, the 527, PACs, and so-called super PACs. Therefore, many choose to contribute money to nonprofits organized as 501C4 groups, which can lobby and engage in electioneering as long as their primary activity, at least half of their overall activity, is not political. A 501c3 uh, has the advantage of uh, being able to give tax deductible contributions. The disadvantages are it cannot engage in political activities or lobbying, only voter education and mobilization. A 527 can spend unlimited amounts on issue advocacy and voter mobilization. It cannot make contributions to candidates or coordinate efforts with candidates or parties. A 501c4 can spend unlimited amounts on electioneering but does not have to disclose and does not have to disclose contributors. At least half of their activities must be non-political. They cannot coordinate efforts with the candidates or the parties. PACs can contribute directly to candidates and parties, but there are strict limits on the direct contribution amounts. Super PACs can spend unlimited amounts on electioneering and can support or oppose specific candidates. They cannot make contributions to candidates or coordinate efforts with candidates or parties. So super PACs have become a major issue with regard to special interests today. Although estimates of total campaign spending suggest that donors have tremendous influence over candidates, the reality is more complicated. Contributions don't buy victories. A substantial amount of campaign cash goes to administrative costs or, to distributed, uh, or is distributed across many candidates and some organizations spend surprisingly little on campaign contributions. Think of how you could use this data that is provided here to argue against claims that interest groups are all powerful players in American elections. And this data is in figure 9.3 of your book. Conventional wisdom says the business interest groups have too much power over policy outcomes in Washington. But what do the numbers say? 
To address this question, a group of political scientists tracked a series of issues through years of lobbying, congressional debate, legislative action, and implementation by the bureaucracy. Their goal was to determine whether business groups were successful in getting what they want from Congress, particularly when their efforts were opposed by citizen groups or government officials. Here's what the researchers found. So business groups versus citizen groups or unions, which groups win and, uh, and when do they win? It's about half and half. Um, business groups win 40% of the time. Uh, the other side wins 40% of the time, citizens groups, and neither win 20% of the time. Business groups versus governmental executive branch members of Congress. Business groups win 36% of the time. Um, congressional groups win 36% of the time, and then nobody wins 27% of the time, or both. Business groups who are unopposed will win 89% of the time versus 11% for the opposition. So when there is opposition to an interest group, when there are two types of interest groups lobbying against each other, then they negate each other, and and I think we as a, as a society end up the winner. But when you have a business group with a lot of money, and 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 that group is unopposed, you end up with that group winning 89% of the time. While many observers credit lobbying by the pharmaceutical industry for policies such as Medicare's pres prescription drug benefits and its ban on importing medicines. Favorable public opinion, the efforts of the AARP and bureaucrats' independent judgment probably had greater influence on passing the Drug Benefit Act. Interest groups are most successful when their issues do not run against citizen preferences. Bills that are not salient mean that legislators do not have to worry about electoral reprisal. In other words, it, it doesn't matter much to the general population. Similarly, issues that do not have entrenched opponents are simple to resolve. Last, no matter what it is easier to fight, uh, no matter what it is easier to fight change in Washington D.C. than to enact it. We'll go back again that, uh, and say that again. No matter what, it is easier to fight change in Washington D.C. than to enact it. The next chapter. Um, will detail, well, actually chapter 10, will detail how many places in Congress a bill can be killed and how hard it's to enact a law. So, um, success of an interest group depends upon preventing change versus implementing change. Preventing change is easier. Salience, low salience results in low electoral consequences and conflict. Low conflict helps interest groups succeed. If you've ever heard of the National Turkey Federation, it's probably because of this participation in an annual presidential pardoning of the turkey before Thanksgiving. The Federation's relative anonymity has been beneficial. Its effort to increase the amount of turkey served in federally funded school lunches was aided by most, uh, was aided by most Americans' lack of awareness of the proposal. So turkey is on the menu at least once a week in the public schools. Why? Because of the National uh, Federation of Turkey Producers or whatever it is. Okay, National Turkey Federation. Now let's look at, uh, in theory, how things work. In lobbying the federal government inside and outside strategies, Outside strategies are public pressure, elections, and the media to influence government. Using public pressure, inf elections, and the media to influence government. Examples. Grassroots email, letter, or phone campaigns. Contributing to election campaigns. And getting media coverage of your cause. Inside strategies include directly lobbying officials in Washington, D.C., meeting with lawmakers, drafting and producing legislation, providing research and testimony, 
and taking the government to court using litigation are all inside strategies. In practice, here's AIPAC and the Iran nuclear deal, which a lot of people have been uh, talking about the Iran nuclear deal because President um, uh, Trump wants to uh, negate uh, or uh, disqualify that deal that we've made. Inside strategies, do we have a deal? On July 14, 2015, the United States and its negotiation part partners announced details of their nuclear agreement with Iran. And they're off. In July 15, 2015, AIPAC announces its opposition to the Iran deal and forms a new advocacy group to lobby against the agreement. Gathering forces. In July 2015, AIPAC organized a series of speeches and town hall meetings in congressional districts and states of undecided legislators. Making introductions. In July 28th to 29th, 2015, AIPAC arranged a Washington fly-in of a series of meetings between lawmakers and hundreds of constituents who are opposed to the deal. Running ads. In August 2015, AIPAC spent over $20 million running television ads opposing the deal in 23 states. And funding trips. August 2015, AIPAC introduced or organized a trip to Israel for 58 members of Congress to meet with Israeli officials and citizens who were opposed to the deal. Going right to the source, in August 2015, AI, uh, AIPAC representatives lobbied undecided senators to oppose the uh, agreement. We still have a deal. September 2, 2015, the deadline for Congress to disapprove, disapprove the deal passes without action. While AIPAC's efforts were ultimately unsuccessful, they illustrate the many ways that interest groups can work to influence the policy process. When scandals surrounding this man, Jack Abramoff, came to light in 2005, many Americans considered him a typical lobbyist. Abramoff's actions were illegal, but the question remains, are his tactics common in Washington or was there a rare exception? Now I have to tell you that Abramoff actually has an El Paso connection because he went to the Tiguas and got them to pay him over two and a half million dollars saying that he was gonna lobby on their behalf uh, at the national level so that they could have uh, legalized gaming. Well, he took that money and actually lobbied for the people who were opposed to legalized gaming. And took uh, so he played both ends against the middle and won and, and hedged his bet and just basically took off with the money. And he went to jail for it. Conservative super PACs, such as the Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC, Old conventions that give candidates a venue to present themselves to conservative activists and donors. And CPAC is where uh, uh, this is this is President Trump at that point, candidate Trump in front of CPAC. All right. So this is the end of this lesson. It's rather short. And um, next week we're going to go on to talking about elections. And then after that, we're going to get into uh we're going to get in our institutions, Congress, um, the um, presidency, the executive branch, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, the judicial branch.